Okay, both recordings are on, so we are all set to begin. Okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and go into presentation mode. <clears throat> Can everybody see my screen? Okay, excellent. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this workshop number two. Uh, where it is a concept workshop for the new elementary school in Madison, Connecticut. Uh, my name is Justin Hopkins with Tecton Architects. I'm a registered architect and associate principal at Tecton, as well as the project manager for the project. Uh, we have a, a detailed agenda for this evening. We'll start with a team introduction, uh, and then we're going to get into a presentation uh, where we're going to go over critical aspects of the project, project roadmap, uh, go recap some of the things that we've heard so far, uh, and then really get into the nuts and bolts of this presentation uh, for concept development. We'll then have an active listening session and then recap about our next steps of the project and how to stay connected. So with us uh, this evening from Tecton, we have Jeff Wazinski, who's the principal in charge. Uh, we also have Catherine Meese, who's our senior interior designer, Antonia Ciavarella, our sustainability and wellness expert, Rachel Pepin, our architectural designer, and uh, we also have our site development folks, Ryan Dean, our senior landscape architect, and Will Walter, our senior project manager from Banesh. Um, Ernest Nepomuceno, who is our senior designer on the project, it has a conflict for this evening. Uh, but we nonetheless like to keep him his headshot in our uh, project team summary. So, so recapping, so those of you who may have been in attendance at our our first public workshop, uh, will this will be familiar territory to you? We like to keep circling back uh, to these key items to act as a touchstone uh, to always remind us what what is important for the project. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a responsible design that balances the vision with the needs as well as with the logistics of the project. We want to make sure that we build in adaptable, flexible, multi-use spaces uh, that will withstand the test of time from both uh, maintenance and uh, longevity standpoint. We want our design to be forward-thinking, diverse, inclusive, and that extends to all components of the project from sustainability to some of our curriculum-based spaces. We wanna make sure that this building has a community use that we can, it's separable from the day-to-day -day operations at the school and can support any type of community event, whether it's after hours or on the weekends uh, that the town of Madison uh, can contemplate. As far as site design, we wanna balance the educational with the technical functionality. Uh, and that includes making sure that our site is working to support the educational curriculum, but also takes care of many of the technical components uh, that we need on a new site. Just as a recap of our, our process um, and our schedule, we are in the conclusion of what we consider schematic design. And this is really the phase of the project where we're establishing the overall basis of design and the overall project parameters. From there, we'll go into design development where we start going space by space, developing some of the details and the requirements uh, at a more technical level. And then finally, construction documentation where we're more or less documenting the building uh, so that it can go out to bid and we'll know how to build it. So uh, we are very much in the beginning of this, uh, this process uh, with a goal of being able to complete construction documents towards the middle of next year. So we did hold our workshop number one, our visioning session. Uh, some of the things that we had heard uh, was to underscore the need and engage the teachers in the conversation. We're happy to report that we have bi-weekly uh, working group meetings where we have uh, members of the administrative team, principals, as well as teacher liaisons that are part of the ongoing uh, conversation and project development. We want to make sure that we have uh, connections to nature and outdoor play and learning. Uh, we'll get into that in some of the site um, uh, site components of the presentation. We want to be able to support the multiple modalities of um, educational spaces, you know, for peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, mentorship, and leadership within the school. 
making sure that special education spaces and resources are easily uh, accessible to all st students and um, also making sure that at all times we're addressing the safety on site and within the building. We also have uh, results of our community survey, number one. Uh, we're happy to report that we received 252 responses um, and we've been able to identify some of the common threads uh, based on those answers from safety and security, which is, uh, which is highly preferred as choice number one uh, from the respondents to the survey, uh, as well as um, outdoor learning and play, sustainability and efficiency, and a 21st century learning environment. So we're gonna get into a recap of the project concept, as well as some of the schematic design development. That's gonna extend from uh, site development. We're gonna get into the building. We'll go over some interiors, as well as we should note that we are also working on uh, the Brown Intermediate School interior renovations. So a lot of the common threads that we're borrowing from an interiors perspective and project goals from a curriculum standpoint, are we have either uh, developed contemporaneous uh, to that process or we are sharing uh, that input and overall design intent with the Brown School. We're then gonna briefly talk about some of our building systems development that, that we've um, developed to date. So for site development, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan and Will, and they can give you a brief overview of the, the site plan development. Ryan? I don't know if uh, Ryan is having. No, we can't hear you. Okay. While we're getting Ryan queued up, I, I neglected to introduce a very valued member of the project team. He does not have a headshot on our masthead, but Adam Levitis from Collier's Engineering. Uh, sorry, Collier's project leaders is the owner's project manager. He's helping to navigate the communication flow and the overall management of the project on behalf of the town of Madison. So, you guys got me now. And that gave Ryan just enough uh, <laughs> time to fix his audio issues. So, go right. ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so, I'm Ryan Dean. I'm the lead landscape architect with Benish. Uh, so, if you weren't at the last uh, community meeting. I'm just going to walk you through the site really quickly. Uh, Mungertown Road is on the left side of your screen, and just through the woods, actually off where the text is on the right, is where the high school is currently. So the site uh, is, a, is a hillside that pitches from Mungertown Road down to a stream to the east. Uh, the building is going to be you know, located kind of uh, perpendicular to that slope. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, there's some, some sections to show how that all works out. There'll be a lower level or a, a upper level entry on the western side and a, a second floor kind of grows out of the bottom um, as it goes down the hill. So what we're looking at currently is uh, two different entrance points. Uh, the one on the south will be, um, uh, yeah, will be, I was, I was actually talking about the uh, streets, but yeah, so the, 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 the curb cut on the south side of the site will uh, allow for the bus loop uh, in the mornings and the afternoons as well as an upper level lot that uh, will accommodate uh, faculty and uh, some amount of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the bottom left lot will, will accommodate the uh, faculty and visitors during the day, as well as the, the lot to the right of that will also be for faculty. And then on the north side of the building, uh, the curb cuts intended to be for parent drop off and pick up for the pre-K and K. So uh, the pre-K or kindergarten parents can park and walk up and get the children, but there's also room for 26 cars to queue up along that curb. Uh, so that gives it plenty of, of uh, area for loading. Uh, as we kind of move down the hill on that by that parking lot, there's going to be the service yard, uh, not really glamorous to talk about where the dumpsters and the generators will be all kind of hidden behind a, a screen wall um, that's set down into the in, down into the grade by about six or eight feet. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that for fire protection, that road leads off and around the, the eastern end of the building uh, with a fire access lane to fight a fire in the event of something unfortunate. Uh, and to the east of that, we'll start with the playgrounds now is you, as you come out of the building on the north, there's, a, you know, could be the one to three playground and then below that the four to five with a basketball court. 
and on the western edge where the pre-k uh, K children will be a uh, 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 playground in close proximity for you know, which will also be screened, which we can talk about in a moment. Um, beyond that to the east is the you know, just an open kind of rolling field. Uh, we have a, a striped, you know, multi-purpose field uh, nestled into that lower the lowlands there, um, all with a, uh, a loop walk for, you know, students or faculty, whoever, uh, with a few outdoor classroom, kind of more formalized outdoor classroom nodes along that that we're thinking will be integrated into you know the the campus as a classroom so as it's as those are closer to the wetlands uh the idea would be to kind of engage the the surroundings of the natural you know site to embrace you know some kind of curriculum um, next slide please so as i was talking about it before on the west or on the left i'm sorry is, is mungertown road uh you know come into the that playground and that you know single story building on the upper level or upper portion of the site that grows into two stories as you drop up, drop off um and as you look to the east there's you know the, the playgrounds and basketball court or to the right um and then an open play field as it slopes down to the to the uh, uh wetlands area next please so, so just to re reiterate ryan Yes. Um, the, the building is technically a two-story building, but we are positioning it within the slope of the site. So each level has an at-grade uh, entrance. So if you're on the lower level, you have the ability to enter out at grade. If you're on the main floor level, you ha also have the ability to enter at grade. So we're accommodate accommodating the overall topography of the site in order to nestle our building within the, the slope. Correct. Uh, closer to Mungertown Road, uh, as we, I was just talking about, was the pre-K um, and, and kindergarten playground. Uh, the, the beauty of this location is not only is it close to the classrooms, but you know there's the opportunity to really create this nice environment with a natural burn that exists um, along Mungertown Road, which we will be adding to from some of the excavation on the site, the foundations, and, and I think we'll build that up to create a real strong privacy buffer um, from from Mungertown. So there'll be you know very filtered views in, if any, um, and you know just with, as you'll see in a moment with the grasses and, and the planting palette that we have, something that'll be a, a nice aesthetic, uh, reflective of kind of a shoreline town. Uh, so I think that that should cover that. This I just want to reiterate um, that this came up in one of our uh, at our PRC meeting uh, where we fielded some questions from the parents representatives uh, about the proximity of the K, uh, the pre K and K playground uh, to Mungertown Road, uh, though there is uh, quite a distance uh, between the building and the playscape to the actual road, we are building in uh, this topography to help uh, make the the playscape feel more secluded, as well as provide some visual and environmental protection from anything that occurs on the road. Correct. Uh, from uh, we'll run through these fairly quickly, but these are just kind of a flavor of of the site finishes. Um, everything from the paving to the the light poles, as you'll see in a moment. You know the the concept on the on the left side of the page is, you know, that kind of entry areas uh, will have, you know, maybe a bluestone type apron, uh, similar to what you see here, um, envisioning granite curving and, you know, granite cobbles where there's, you know, need for uh, traffic calming measures at, you know, drop off zones, potentially an apron at the road. Um, and then the, the fire lane will be um, provided, you know, using some, some portion, you know, the width that's needed for the truck uh to be grass pavers as well as a concrete sidewalk so we don't have an 18 foot walk you know being sensitive to the um, amount of runoff on the site so trying to just ratchet that down with a, a new technology to, to make that all work next uh we've been talking you know about how, what we're going to do or you know what the style of these playgrounds and outdoor classrooms want to be uh, you know, the resilient play surfacing shown on the bottom left is is intended to be in all the play playscapes, uh, you know, th that squishy, um, you know, foamy feeling you know, padded surface for the for the kids, which will integrate some designs into that. And we're starting to talk about the, you know, the, the enclosures with the fences. Do we want it to be a little bit more playful and, and thematic with the school? 
Um, and also, you know, as they as the, the playgrounds lead to those outdoor classrooms, the bottom right is a, is a you know idea of integrating uh, rain rainwater harvesting into the playground, and kids get to splash around in it. You know, all that all that good stuff. So it's it's understanding you know surface runoff and and making that part of the educational process of playing. Next. Uh, again, with any of the boulders that we're going to be using on the site, you know, just kind of the aesthetic of maybe an entry wall uh, assigned for the elementary school um, on the left side, just that kind of aesthetic, not necessarily that, you know, residential entry gate, but then, you know, using kind of the, the loose stones or clusters of stones to start to accommodate some of the grades and create, you know, seating surfaces. Definitely going to keep that fox in there um, for sure. That's in the upper photo. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the aesthetic that we'll have around the site, as well as, you know, kind of passive agrarian feeling planting beds. Uh, next. Uh, lighting, again, we're trying to go for like the, the kind of dockside, you know, uh, oceanfront town feel. Uh, so this is just some of the ideas of the lighting and the bollards that we are going to try to employ um, throughout the site, parking lots and, and sidewalks. Next. Uh, again, furniture is trying to stay in that same uh, same family. So just some concepts of what we're looking at for you know site furnishings. Next, uh, the back end of the the building uh, being the service yard. You know this we're doing to keep it as simple as possible with you know some screen fencing around the generators and, and dumpsters, uh, which you'll see on the left, and then you know the modest retaining wall will be very similar to what you see on the right here, uh, which will kind of have the backside of the generator and transformer um, next to it. Next, uh, we've got you know new uh, playscape opportunities for you know every every age through uh, fifth grade. So looking at the opportunities to you know theme that you know whether it be you know with a, a natural uh, sustainable board you know wood system that they've got now and all these great new playgrounds, um, or do we do something a little bit more brighter you know brighter and more playful? Um, that's something that we're kind of deciding now, but you know, it should be a very nice, fun, safe environment for you know children of all ages and abilities, uh, which is you know definitely in, in our design intent. Next, uh, and just some of the, the planting material, you know, the pallets, just, just the character feel of what the site might feel like. The top left is a great image, uh, you know, a new new construction with the the sedge and you know some kind of plantings. Uh, keep you know a, a what would be an open space, uh, you know, makes it feel a little more intimate, but, you know, along the pathways having, you know, shoreline type grasses and sedum, um, and also the bottom right, you know, that dune feel on a golf course, you know, that's kind of what we're going to use some of the, the low, as low maintenance areas, um, especially along that grade break um, between the, you know, the first floor and the, and the lower floor. Uh, next. And with that, I'll hand it off to Will, a uh, civil engineer. Thank you. Trying so real, real briefly, just to bring everybody up to speed on the utility design. The first thing is uh, we're going to be getting fire protection and domestic water. Um, we're going to be extending the public main about a half mile up the road. So you can see in the upper left, it's the purple that's coming uh, down. The provider is Connecticut Water. We've had a couple meetings with them, and that water main is un is currently under design. You can see on the left-hand side, the long green. Uh, so that's the septic system for a variety of uh, permitting reasons. We need to pump the septic design up to the top of the site and the, and the septic field is gonna be a long linear field. The permitting authorities are the uh, Madison Public Health Department and the Connecticut Department of Public Health. We've met with them on site. We've did probably 20 or 30 test pits in a bunch of uh, percolation tests, and that design is currently underway. And then stormwater is in the light blue, and our design intent is to do several above ground biofiltration areas and then several uh, linear shallow underground systems. And the stormwater is going to be tied to the design of the septic system. They'll be integrated so that we can naturally dilute the, uh, the nitrogen concentration of that of the, the leach, the leach, the, the septic, I'm sorry, as it flows underground from up high near Mongertown down towards the wetlands. Uh, and as far as the stormwater, the permitting authorities are the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection and the Madison Engineering Department. And we've been in touch with both of them. 
and we're aware of the regulations and designing to meet uh, to meet the intent uh, of those regulations. And then the way you see in the red, the project will also incorporate uh, geothermal well field, and it's going to be located as shown in the red. Okay, at this time, I'd like to uh, have a brief pause and ask if there's uh, that is if there are any questions related to the site design. Um, and if not, we can, it's, there's no penalty. Uh, if you don't ask the question now, you can ask it later during our active listening session. But we figured since we're on the topic of site, if there's any specific question uh, that anybody has uh, in attendance, we can certainly field it right now. Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll get into the building development. Thank you, Ryan and Will. So um, as we had mentioned, there are two stories within the building. The site um, section that Ryan went over more or less illustrates the way that the floor plates uh, kind of come together. Uh, the floor plan on the upper level is our main floor. The one on the lower level is our lower uh, floor. Uh, and they stack according to this axonometric. Uh, our overall main floor plan uh, has our uh, grade wings of uh, kindergarten and pre-K uh, towards the west of the floor plan. Uh, we have our lower elementary uh, grades uh, one and two, uh, all the way to the east portion of the, the site plan. Our admin suite is located at the for the green uh, bar here off of our main entrance. The areas in dark orange are our uh, special education and resource rooms. Our specials really are placed at the heart of the building, our media center, STEAM, art, and music. So the purpose of this is to create an active uh, building core uh, that is centrally located in the heart of the building uh, so that it's within close proximity to uh, all of our, our grades. We have some blow ups of these floor plans, so I'll give the the uh, broad overview. And then as we get into the larger ones, we can point out uh, um, other uh, other items. So our lower level is where our gymnasium and our cafeteria and our kitchen, as well as our loading area. Uh, this is our upper elementary wing, our grades three, four and five. That is more or less configured in the same general configuration as our, our main floor level. Uh, we do have uh, a number of at-grade means of egress uh, for these folks at the lower level. So starting at the uh, uh, on a large floor plan for our main floor, our pre-K and K-wing, um, four classes of each, uh, we do have an exterior courtyard. So this is within the perimeter of the building, but it's open to the air. And the idea is that we can have um, communication. This can serve as a dedicated exterior classroom uh, on occasion. Uh, it has proximity to both the K and pre-K wings as well as uh, the art and STEAM classrooms. So uh, the concept is if there's a class that's in here, you know, we can open up uh, this wall so that it spills out into the courtyard. Same thing for art. More towards the middle of the building, um, as we had mentioned previously, uh, our media center that has some flexible classroom space uh, for ad hoc uh, instruction. Uh, if a class needs to have a dedicated dedicated instruction within the media center that's outside of their, their general classroom environment, uh, we can easily program that. Uh, this corridor becomes very prominent off of uh, both the north and the south entrances uh, in order to try and highlight the, the relationship and the collaboration between our art, STEAM, music, and media center. Towards uh, the west portion of the main level, again, we have our grades one and two wing wings, uh, as well as our world languages and phase uh, uh, classroom. 
here we can start to see how the core is duplicated between the lower level and the main level for these grade for these learning communities. We have our resource uh, rooms as well as our intervention intervention spaces uh, that end end up being in close proximity to the classrooms in order to support pull out push in uh, instruction. At our lower level, uh, we have our gymnasium and cafeteria. We positioned our platform in, in a way that it can support both the presentation, say an all school assembly in the gymnasium or a smaller presentation or performance uh, within the cafeteria. So the idea is that uh, the platform basically has two fronts that can support um, multiple different kinds of presentation. Cafeteria is located in close proximity to our covered outdoor dining area. And as Ryan had described, where our service entry is, um, is at the north of this section. Our eastern portion of the lower level uh, is, as we had mentioned, our grade three, four, and five uh, uh, grade levels. Uh, the resource and uh, math intervention uh, spaces are more or less duplications. Uh, in order to provide some continuity of, of um, the learning communities as students kind of age uh, through the, uh, the grade levels. So a couple of conceptual views uh, we'd like to go over. Uh, the first one is at the uh, main level entrance as you approach the, the cafeteria. So again, these are concept images where you can really start to see uh, where how we're accommodating accommodating the grade level uh, difference from the main level down to the lower level. Uh, so this is a view looking into our stair, our main entrance to the main level and our stair vertical um, circulation core, as well as um, our cafeteria. Our next view is upon entrance at the main level, uh, looking down our, um, our media center and STEAM and art classroom wing. So this is again a view once you you get into um, uh, through the main entrance. And uh, a view from our media center really showing what the design intent is. Um, as we had mentioned that collaborative communication between both the media center and the STEAM classroom and the art classroom. The idea that for a, a school-wide uh, function, uh, STEAM night, uh, et cetera, we'll be able to open up these walls uh, to have a lot of collaboration between the spaces. Okay, interiors development. Catherine, um, if you'd like to take it from here. I don't know if you're still having audio issues. I don't know, let's see. Can you all you hear got me? it. Yep. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. So I wanted to kind of focus uh, this on um, talking to you about the the interiors and how we're going to knit them together with, um, as Justin mentioned before, the work that we're, we've already been working on in Brown, um, which was very much focused on uh, the classroom spaces and the, really the learning environments. So when we talk about classrooms, um, classroom design, these uh, zones are kind of the three main activities that we're supporting. So what I like to call ready, set, go, uh, activity and play, and then focus on learning. And if Justin, if, I know I've got some animations in here, which you don't probably want to drive us through, but if you can, you can flip, flip through. So ready, set, go is really just our, our cubbies getting into the room, you know, putting your things away in the morning, being able to go over and get them um, before you leave, activity and play. When we're talking about at Brown, obviously, this is kindergarten, first grade spaces. Um, we're talking about play areas, you know, um, choice time, that kind of thing. And then focus and learning really is our more traditional um, classroom area with our teaching wall. If you want to go to the next slide for me. On the left, what you can see is um, a typical classroom layout that we have done for the K-1 wing at Brown. <clears throat> so you can kind of see how those zones play out. Um, and then on the right-hand side would be a typical classroom for the new elementary. So it's a little bit of a different orientation, <clears throat> which has everything to do with how the building, how our existing Brown building is already built. And then the new elementary, um, because of 
a number of things, our classrooms are a slightly different orientation. Um, but as you can see, the, the three activities are still supported. And if you click one more time for me, Justin, you'll see the main difference here is how we're the, the entrance into the classroom. Um, so the idea is that um, you're, when you're coming in to the door, your ready, set, go area is right there. And then also um, that when you're coming in, you're on the teaching wall. So the teacher's desk would be positioned such that they could see anyone entering into the door. So those are our main objectives. And those were both um, met in both of these layouts. And then the next um, kind of priority is that the activity area, one of the reasons that we want to keep that away from our teaching wall is really to make sure that um, we're not you know, adding distraction. There's always enough to look at in the classroom because they're looking at each other, they're trying to look out the window. Um, so especially in, in the new elementary, we were able to keep the windows so that they're a little bit um, behind where you're actually focused on your teaching wall. Um, we're just trying to create a, a, you know, an area where you can really focus and learn. So uh, again, similarities between these, you've got your interactive screen in the center and then tax surface and dry erase on either side. And if you flip one more, Justin, you'll kind of see it. I think, yeah. Uh, so this is an elevation of just one of the, the walls in brown. Um, this also gives us an opportunity to bring in a pop of color. In a minute, I'll share with you um, kind of some ideas of color palettes that we've been working on. Um, but just to bring some color to that wall, to bring the focus to that wall, um, and then plenty of display uh, space for the teachers. Same thing here with the ceilings. I won't go into too much detail, but again, we approach these in a very similar way between the two schools. Um, so we're using a linear lighting, um, very modern. Uh, it's LED, so um, energy conscious, and also provides a really even light. Um, uh, same coloration um, in the light between the two schools. Um, and we've kind of created a zone. If you flip one more time for me. Um, in that lower portion of the, the classroom at the ready, set, go area. That's um, an opportunity for us to lower the ceiling a little bit, which also creates kind of a more intimate entry um, feel to the classroom um, and also provides an opportunity to our uh, mechanical engineers for them to run um, some duct work there. So again, in our classrooms, we. Um, one thing that we've been talking with the, uh, the administrators about is, is creating that area of focus. So really just um, keeping our colors light, bright, um, something that's uh, you know, welcoming to students. We do want to incorporate color, but we want to do so in a very um, purposeful way so that, again, we're not creating distraction, but we're leading the eye where we want it to, to go. Um, so again, like that accent on the, on the teaching wall, and that will find its way into other room, uh, places in the room as well. And then uh, lastly, this is just a, um, a palette on the left-hand side. Um, this is actually been further developed uh, for, for Brown, um, but this is kind of where we started with for Brown, and then also um, showing you kind of how we're connecting that to the new elementary. So we developed a palette for Brown, um, and we will be um, kind of working from that and applying color in a very similar way here at the new school. My apologies, I was on mute. Um, so just a couple of brief um, slides to describe our building systems, and then we can get into the active listening uh, session and the, the feedback portion of the presentation. So uh, rather than take a pause here, I think I'd like to just go through these next slides, um, and then we can get to some uh, honest feedback here. So we've been working uh, with our mechanical engineers, our MEP, FP engineers, uh, Kohler Ronan, uh, to develop an energy model at the schematic design phase of the, the project. Uh, from the beginning of this project, there was a goal for an EUI, uh, which more or less is the amount of energy use intensity uh, for the building. Uh, the goal EUI of 28 um, and our current energy models uh, are at 22. So think of EUI as like golf, the lower the, lower the score, the better performance uh, we have here. So 
number of things that go into this is understanding what is driving our loads uh, for our building uh, and then making sure that we're accommodating uh, the delivery of the energy in a responsible manner. One of the things that is part of uh, this particular project is we so far are have developed a carbon free uh, energy source, uh, which means that most of the demand of the building is electric. Uh, and we are also providing heating and cooling uh, from a geothermal geo exchange system with geothermal wells, uh, as Will had pointed out on our site utility portion. We are continuing to go through uh, uh, development of where the mechanical systems are within the building. Uh, the goal is to have these spaces, both the air handling unit, so the major uh, air movement of the building, as well as a decentralized system for uh, our water circuit uh, to provide heating and cooling to the, the, the uh, spaces. So by decentralizing the system and by providing uh, some of the major equipment on the interior portion of the building rather than roof mounted, uh, we have been able to free up most of the roof space for a future photovoltaic array. Uh, so that is something that would further reduce uh, the EUI of the building. So these are continuing to be, be discussions with uh, the town, uh, with our commissioning agent uh, that is a third party um, um, uh, commission, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing commissioning. Uh, engineer that it has some oversight of the building systems uh, to keep us on task. So from there, um, we would like to open it up uh, for questions and answers. And some of the things that we'd like to hear from you is, you know, I'd like to uh, think of these things as right track, wrong track. Um, so what what are we on the right track? What are we on the right track on uh, for the project? Is there anything that we may be going, in your opinion, uh, down the wrong track and needs improvement? Um, we ask you to consider, um, is the space and what we've shown you, is it functioning effectively? Are the space adjacencies uh, correct? Is there anything that stands out to you that needs improvement? Um, safety and security, uh, do we need some further feedback or explanation on that? And does it support an innovative teaching environment? So I have uh, both the site plan and um, the floor plans if we need to toggle through them. Uh, but at this point, we'd ask if there's any, any questions. OK, there's a hand raised. Ryan O'Connor. A moment, so, so, I will promote him. OK, great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I I like the designs very nice. Um, it looks very, you know, obviously, uh, it, you know, appropriate for the education and um, the aesthetics and convenience and everything. One thing that I worry about is, I, I hate bringing this up, but um, in this day and age. I feel like a design should incorporate some safety measures for protection against gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, uh, it it's a, it's a, unfortunately a real threat now, and you know, in, in in the U.S. And to me, you know, having uh, rooms without escape routes is, uh, you know, a little bit daunting. Um, you know, so having your you know, these internal rooms that, uh, you know, you you you're, it's the whole sitting duck phenomenon, right? I mean, that's a, you know, the, what unfortunately these people come in and uh, kids and teachers have nowhere to go um, because there's there's no exit other than where, you know, the gunman is standing at. And, and again, I hate talking about this, but 
I feel like every room should have a hallway and an outdoor, you know, uh, uh, exit. And in fact, I, I think that the outdoor exit should maybe multiple, you know, at Jeffrey, how it is right now is that, you know, I'm ob obviously you're, you're probably aware, but it, it looks like each room has an, an outdoor exit. And uh, although I, I don't think that it, it should, that door should be accessible from the outside unless it's via, you know, keypad or something like that. It, I feel like it should be there so that there is, you know, more of a proper escape route for, you know, in case something, you know, catastrophic happens along these lines. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. If it's okay, if, if I may call you Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So first of all, uh, don't feel bad ab about bringing this up. Um, this is a reality, unfortunately, that um, we are faced with as uh, designers of, of public schools. And um, I will say that we, we are, we encounter these questions uh, and the, and incorporate design principles in every school that we design. And I'll start by, um, by bringing up the SEPTED principles, which is crime prevention through environmental design. Um, and that starts with making sure that our control of the site, our control of the building starts with control of the site. And that means uh, one thing that Ryan did not mention um, in, for, in the description of the, the site plan is that we do have some gates here uh, that we anticipate being closed um, during the day, during the non-bus pickup and drop-off areas in order to allow um, visitor parking in this limited area, which then has close, uh, which then has visibility from our administrative suite, which is at the front of this building. So the first line of defense is making sure that we have eyes on potential people that are, that are approaching the building. Um, the second is making sure that we we have, as I mentioned, visibility uh, at our entrances, and I'm going to um, go to the floor plan. Uh, then making sure that once we ultimately ha may have a breach in the perimeter of the in the entrance of the building, first of all, standard safety protocols where you need to be buzzed in uh, to our vestibule and then buzzed again in to our main office. Uh, provided that once we get here, we have a series of doors to compartmentalize the rest of the building. So these are doors that would be on, say, magnetic hold opens uh, during the day. In the event of a, a lockdown or a fire alarm, these doors then the magnetic holds release um, and the doors shut. So from there, we have a locked compartment for our K and um, pre-K wing. Uh, we have the same thing towards the eastern end of the, the building, and that's replicated on the lower level. Uh, to start with the building perimeter, um, we also have a uh, built-in, any at-grade glazing uh, would have what's called school guard glazing, uh, which is intruder resistant, um, that even if um, there is a uh, ballistic that penetrates that glass, it prevents further intrusion into the, the building. With respect to, um, uh, maybe I'll, we can have Catherine uh, describe uh, some of the principles within a, a classroom. Um, we went over this uh, quite a bit in detail for some of the Brown uh, design, uh, where we discussed the ability to, uh, to limit visibility into a classroom uh, from a closed door to allow areas within that classroom to be uh, for students to be able to shelter in place outside of the visibility of the uh, of somebody that would be standing at the door. And I know I just keyed up Catherine to then go over exactly what I just said. Uh, but Catherine, if, if there's anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, um, sure. Thanks, Justin. So uh... It, with respect to the classroom doors, um, that was something that we paid a lot of attention to at Brown. We talked a lot about a lot of different options. And of course, um, when it comes to safety, um, it is so important. And it's also important to talk through all the different pros and cons 
of the different approaches. So with the doors, um, what we ended up deciding at Brown, again, um, through the interactions that we were having with the administration um, was that they do want to have visibility into the classroom. So we have a piece of vision glazing in the door. It's narrow. Um, it's just enough so that when you're walking past the classroom with a closed door, that an administrator can look in and see in the classroom, especially if you stand up close, you can look over, um, you know, and see, see in. However, um, as you know, we've, you know, your, your door at home, if you're to break glass and reach in, you know, that's an easy way to unlock um, a door from the inside. So what we did with the, um, the glazing uh, in the door was actually put it on the opposite side of the door from your, uh, your latch side. So it was actually towards the hinge side of the door um, so that if someone were to penetrate the school and then get into the corridor with the classroom um, and actually make it to a classroom door um, and then break the glass on that, uh, that door, they still can't reach their arm in and get to the handle of that door. Um, we also have uh, the way that we did the flooring pattern, um, the, the part of the room that would be visible is a different tone of flooring from the part of the room that would not be. Um, and it, it actually just works as um, kind of a lovely flooring design. Um, so it's not the kind of thing where you think about, you know, our school's gonna feel like a prison if we make it safe. It's the kind of thing where um, it just so happens to be mutually beneficial. Um, so we, you know, we needed to do, do something to make the flooring interesting. And it just so happens that that also um, can be used as a, a kind of a safety guideline so students know where to go. Yeah, um, we do. Uh, there is a uh, state law that requires us now in schools to also make sure that we have operable windows as, as part of any school um, classroom. Uh, so it, it is relatively uncommon to have a dedicated door um, outside of each classroom uh, to directly to the exterior. Um, and those tip, when those are in place, they typically become more problematic uh, over the, the long term uh, than simply providing an operable window. So, uh, Jeff, I don't know if there's anything that I missed. Uh, or well, Catherine missed. I think the other key point is that the all projects in the state of Connecticut need to comply with the school safety and infrastructure guidelines, which is a document, multi-layered approach from site all the way through building, um, building systems, in fact. Um, so there's a, a series of strategies that need to be implemented, which I think Justin and Catherine kind of touched on a few. Um, some are, are more present, you know, and in front of you so you can see them and then others are, are kind of environmental designs. So um, it's really a multi-layered approach to the safety infrastructure in the building. And it's not just about, you know, the technical compliance, it's about the design as well. So um, admittedly, we will we'll add some more graphics to better clarify some of the strategies, not all of them, um, but rest assured, um, we'll meet all of those requirements in the infrastructure guidelines. Okay. There is, uh, to this point, there is a, an attendee who has written, can a remote monitoring access control system for all gates, doors, windows be used with the magnetic latch doors and gates? That might mitigate the need for extra doors, or it would be better control the extra doors in each room. So yes, um, the IT uh, and security component to this is making sure that we have monitoring of, of exterior apertures, doors and windows uh, in the form of both access control, so a credential entrance, but also monitoring to make sure that we know when those doors are open. Uh, couple that with a uh, video surveillance system at the building perimeter and at key parts uh, of interior passageways. Um, we will have the ability to monitor and get real-time information uh, throughout the building. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Any other members, any other attendees uh, wish to, we have Kristen Garnett. In a moment, I will promote her. Um, while Kristen is being promoted, if I may, there's another um, question in the chat. 
um, asking about a way for, uh, is there a way for the second floor rooms to have the potential to have a way to the outside um, in case of an emergency, similar to how you might a ladder or a slide similar to an airplane. So, um, okay, I'll try and field that one, but the rest of the group, if you'd like to jump in as well. Um, we, we, we typically don't provide uh, that for an elevated classroom. It's something that we can investigate and talk to the, the administration um, as we continue to develop the plans. Uh, the, the idea is that um, we would like to have the ability uh, and the goal uh, to be able to have students be safe within the classrooms. So from those, um, from those principles that myself, Catherine, and Jeff talked about, uh, they would have a safe shelter in place. Uh, there is, uh, as I had mentioned, operable windows in each classroom, uh, and we will investigate um, that potential. Okay. Okay, Kristen. Hi there, thank you. Um, I am just thinking about parking, um, especially for parent visitation. It looks to me like the school is being built for about 100 students per grade level. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand, I'm just wondering where would you envision, like on a back to school night or an event, even a grade level event, where will all these parents be parking? So um, we have had a number of these discussions in some of our site development um, uh, planning meetings with our working group. Uh, we are investigating. So a couple of principles is that you don't you don't provide uh, all of the spaces necessary. This is going to sound callous, but hear me out. Let me uh, let me get around to it. You don't provide um, part if you're going to have 500 people needing to park um, one or two nights a year you do not provide 500 parking spaces. Um, so what, what does that mean? It means that we need to be able to provide the ability for um, overflow parking. Uh, and that is uh, a strategy that we're looking at with Banesh uh, to build in some areas that are perhaps along uh, the pick up and drop off lane uh, where we can build in some additional parking spaces. Um, that would, would, in the day-to-day -day operation, they are not day-to-day um, -day parking spaces, but they have the ability for those nights um, to have uh, people park on, say, a grass paver uh, rather than pavement. So uh, the quantity of parking spaces is something that we are will continue uh, to review and. Um, and provide as many parking spaces as we can responsibly on the, the project site. For, for what it's worth, I attended the, uh, Catherine and I attended the Brown uh, uh, pre-bid conference yesterday. Uh, and it, it was a great, it was a great time to walk some contractors through the building, but what we didn't anticipate is all the people that would be voting uh, yesterday. So, um, that particular, if, if anybody voted at Brown yesterday, uh, you know yeah. that there was parking all the way out uh, to the end of the, the road uh, along, uh, along the driveway. So uh, similarly, we don't, we wouldn't design um, the parking spaces for that every two year or every four year event. Um, but we would want to make sure that we have the ability to accommodate uh, those those nights where we're going to have more than 150 uh, cars that are parking on yeah. site. It's, it really is a, a good question, and it deserves an awful lot of time to analyze the proper areas to where we can um, we can allow shoulder parking. And um, both Will and Ryan have generated, although you don't see them on the screen tonight, have generated several different options for us to study where that overflow parking could occur, whether it's you, <clears throat> whether it's you mount the, you know, a curb and, and slide over to the grass where there's a stabilized grass area all along the entrance roads. But um, 
as we develop the plan, we'll certainly keep that in mind to, to make sure we can flex the, the total amount of spaces. So, yeah, and just to just to make everybody aware, uh, the, the total amount of parking that we're going to need on a regular basis is between 125 and 135 spaces. And right now we're providing 172 paved spaces. And like Jeff said, there's going to be opportunities for overflow, but you can see where all the buses are parked and where all the cars are parked, that those are also locations that during an overflow night once, twice a year. So um, we've been thinking about it, like Jeff said, and, and we're going to have, um, you know, much ample space for more than what's typically required on a regular day. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Any other questions? Uh, you can raise your hand. You can put the question in the chat. Okay. Just okay. We got Kristen again. Sorry. Hi, sorry. Kristen. Hi, sorry. Um, I just happen to be a neighbor. So, um, and and that's my parking concern is, you know, there just isn't the, the length of the driveway that there is in Brown here with Mungertown Road being so narrow. Um, so my other question is, can you talk a little bit more about the geothermal? I'm not familiar with how that works or what the that um, equipment will look like. Okay. So the, the geothermal well system is a, is a subsurface system. I'm, I'm going to take a crack at this, uh, and then, uh, Jeff, if you want to jump in and, and uh, uh, pick up any of the pieces that I may have left on the table here. Um, geothermal well system is a way that we use uh, the, the consistent temperature of the earth uh, to modulate our building temperatures. Uh, so we use it for uh, a heat sink uh, when we are cooling the building, uh, and we use it for um, a heat source when we're heating the building. It is a subsurface system where we have a series of uh, wells uh, that is considered a closed loop. So we drill approximately 425, 450 feet into the earth. Um, and have a, a water loop that goes through approximately 72 to 78 wells uh, that are in the area on site. Uh, by circulating the water through those standing columns or those wells, we're able to provide a consistent water temperature um, utilizing the natural temperature of the earth. That water then gets pumped into the building and is used uh, to assist in generating uh, a heat source or a cooling source, depending on the season. But you know, what's if if I'm a neighbor and I'm concerned, and I ask a question about geothermal. What's great about it is you're not going to have rooftop equipment. You're not going to look out across wherever you are and look across the building and see large pieces of rooftop mounted equipment that that make noise. This the the piping, as Justin had said, is is underground. All the pumps go into the building. There's a, there's a vault out on site that's subsurface. Um, so it's it's a very efficient energy efficient system, and that's why we're looking at it. But the the net result from a, an aesthetic on the outside and noise and things like that, um, all of that kind of goes away because um, you're really utilizing that that geo exchange um, of the of the water. So, and then all the other utilities. And I don't know if we went over this in great detail, but maybe you can show your cursor, Justin, as far as um, uh, deliveries, uh, dumpsters, um, a generator, we've tucked them into kind of an alcove that's really tight close to the building. Um, and that's well screened as well um, from, a, from a landscaping and a fencing and, and wall perspective. So what we're really trying to do is, is um, respect and preserve a lot of the natural kind of features of the site. Um, so that we have good buffers, you know, overall on the site from from our neighbors, trying to be a good neighbor with some of the traffic, but also with all the equipment, keeping it close, tight to the building, and 
and either inside the building or, or, cold, or very well concealed. That answer your question, Kristen? Um, I think so. I happen to be an abutter to the north. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I have, you know, we just have some other concerns that I should probably put in writing or, um, you know, privacy. I, I understand if the geo, geothermal would be appealing, it's a super high water table there. You probably found it with your park tests. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're going to hit water pretty fast. So, um, and, and the parking is really, I, I mean, I raised my kids in, in this town and I know that on any kind of an event, it, the, the parking is a real problem. And you're not going to have enough bus lane, you know, like if other buses from hand need to go by down Munger Town Road, you're not going to, and you got everybody parked along Munger Town Road, you're going to have a problem. Okay, uh, thank you. I I do not. I, I think as we're developing the parking uh, strategies, the goal is to not utilize Mungertown Road as part of the overall the overflow parking concept. Right. You can plan that way, but people will do what they're going to do. You know. Okay. Thank you, though. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. We have a few additional questions in the chat, if I may jump sure. in. Um, first question is, is there a pre-K, is the pre-K or K playground surrounded by a fence? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep, there'll be a fence around the outside edge of the, the blue areas um, in all of these locations so that they're contained, as well as the, the screening and the, the berm and the buffer um, for visual screening from the road. Perfect. Um, we have two more. Um, unless we have, if we have folks with hands raised, we can go back and forth. Okay. Would uh, you so like to read? Go ahead. Sure. I'll keep going until we. Um, the next question in the chat is uh, as as relates to Brown School. Uh, Brown School has been referenced a few times regarding design. I understand this presentation is specifically about the new building. Will there be a presentation for the Brown changes? I, um, the short answer is uh, yes, I believe so. Um, I know we are preparing a summary presentation for both Brown and the new uh, pre-K to five school uh, uh, for next Tuesday's BOE meeting uh, to provide an overall summary. One of the things that we found is we've had previous public forums um, and also had um, some interactive sessions uh, with members of the community where we specifically discussed uh, the elementary school and a lot of the questions that we got were about, well, what about Brown? Um, are, are we handling some of uh, these same principles? So what, we're, what we've tried to do with this presentation was demonstrate that um, through the efforts of um, some targeted capital projects at Brown, we're trying to incorporate, or the district, is incorporating similar design principles for the, the uh, classroom experience and the curriculum experience. So part of our presentation is um, to show that we are approaching uh, these concepts hand in hand with an eye towards both presentations. So that's a long-winded way of saying that the reason why it's necessary for us to bring it up is because we want to make sure that we are having that um, continuity between the spaces. With respect to an overall presentation, um, we will we'll have one at the BOE and we'll discuss with the district uh, about the opportunity to provide additional um, information regarding Brown. Okay, Antonia. Sure, thank you. Um, the next question um, is as it relates to the, um, the building form, following uh, back up onto our security conversation from earlier, I appreciate the measures taken and they are to a large degree preventative, but could an S-shaped building be considered or one with parallel corridors to again allow a wall 
to face the outdoors for all rooms. Um, as is now, I still don't see how those kids and teachers on the inside rooms have anywhere to go in case of a threat. Okay, so I, I think that question is um, related to some of our non-perimeter rooms. Um, I, um, the, the goal is for our, all of our classroom, classrooms proper is to make sure that we have perimeter, um, uh, we're on a, the perimeter of the building so that we have access to natural light. We then uh, select some of our occasional classrooms uh, where students, we know the students are not in, um, not in that room for the durations that they are in the classrooms. Um, it, it's just, it's a matter of um, responsible and efficient building design that invariably we do have some interior spaces um, that are, that is part of the overall um, building. Um, it's, it would be cost, it, it would be a tremendously inefficient building if every single one of our spaces uh, had access to uh, a perimeter wall. I, I think if I can jump in yep. um, this, you know, it's a good topic to kind of keep on discussing, obviously, as we as we move through design. Um, one of the strategies that we've we've implemented in some of our other designs or some of our other schools is um, communicating doors across a few of the classrooms so that it does provide an alternative means um, you know, secondary egress, ingress. Um, so I, I think exploring some of those strategies, which would get you kind of to what I think Mr. O'Connor's comment about dual or parallel travel lanes. Um, so I think definitely worth putting on the list to explore with um, our work, working group to understand if it, if it makes sense from a from an overall safety security strategy. So um, it's good to bring up because we have done that in other and other um, educational facilities as well as a as a as a means to kind of address what what's been raised. Yeah, and to to um, Mr. O'Connor's points and you know some of the other uh, discussions about uh, security. I think it's it, our our next public presentation when we start getting into more details of the the building. I think it would be uh, to everyone's benefit. Uh, to have a few slides where we specifically talk about uh, this, the security components of the, the building. So, okay, um, I see another question that says, will there be ventilation for the kiln room in the art room? Yes. Yes, we're, we're required uh, by code and by by the general oper operability of the kiln uh, to provide direct exterior ventilation. Okay. Okay, we'll see if there are any additional questions that, that pop up or any additional hands raised. Okay, um, and I, I believe, uh, Zoe, this is, this is being streamed to YouTube. Uh, so this, there may be additional questions or comments that are part of those, uh, those that portal uh, that we may be able to pick up. So, okay. They can't comment live, they can just watch, but then Maybe if you mention the email for the building committee right now, that people will be able to know where they can submit those questions if they have yes. them. Yes. Um, but before we before we move on, um, I do want to thank everybody uh, for these questions. These are all great questions, um, and you know, being able to uh, address them and and being able to answer the question ultimately makes uh, for a stronger design. Um, a more secure building and a, and a tighter overall uh, concept uh, to the building. So um, the input that we receive is always va valuable. So thank you so much, uh, uh, those of you that have asked these questions. Um, 
I do want to mention that before we get to the communication part of, uh, of this wrap up, uh, we do have a community survey that will soon uh, be available to the public. Uh, this will be similar to our uh, survey number one. Uh, we also are in the midst of our cost estimation uh, period for schematic design, uh, at which time uh, we will regroup with the building committee and um, then get to work on some of the uh, design development of the, the project. Uh, we anticipate uh, another workshop in the middle of January. Uh, which will address a lot of the questions that, that came up uh, tonight, uh, as well as uh, provide some further detail uh, of our, our design. So um, how to stay connected. Uh, there's a project e email, fbc at madisonct.org. Uh, we, we also have a project website, uh, that is part of the Madison um, District uh, website. And we're also on social media at Madison Public Schools. So with that, um, I would like to thank everybody that has joined us this evening. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. And um, thanks again for all of your valuable feedback. And with that, I am going to stop sharing. Okay. I think I feel uh, Zoe. We're going to have to get some music, music to kind of play us off, like the.